How excited are you here to be here today for Norm Lewis? Okay. So my guest today is one of Broadway's most sought after leading men. He has been seen in films, on television, the stage, opera, and concert halls around the country and the world. On Broadway, he made his debut as the specialist in the Who's Tommy, followed by John in Miss Saigon, Jake in Sideshow, Eddie in The Wild Party, Painter in Amour, Billy Flynn in Chicago, Javert in Les Miserables, that's my French for the day, <laughs> King Triton in Disney's The Little Mermaid, Sondheim on Sondheim opposite Barbara Cook and Vanessa Williams and gave a career-defining performance as Porgy in the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. <laughs> Starring alongside Audra McDonald. Other New York stage roles include Valentine in Shakespeare in the Parks, Two Gentlemen of Verona, Nathan in Dessa Rose, Roger in A New Brain, Doc in Captain's Courageous, the Actors Fund concerts of Dream Girls, Hair, and Chess. Regionally, he has been seen as Curtis in Dream Girls opposite Jennifer Holliday. Baby, Company, Ragtime, The Fantastics, and Sweeney Todd. He spent a year playing the role of Javert in the West End production of Les Miserables and was honored to play the same role for the 25th anniversary concert, which is absolutely brilliant, and it's now available on DVD. And this summer he played it again at the Muni, directed by Richard J. Alexander. On television, he is known to millions of fans as assistant DA Keith McLean on All My Children and Senator Edison Davis on ABC's political thriller Scandal. That's your scandal, opposite Kerry Washington and Tony Goldwyn. His latest film to be released is Winter's Tale, opposite Russell Crowe and Jennifer Conley. And his new CD is entitled This Is The Life. And he just finished up the new Stephen Sondheim and Wynton Marsalis special encores event called A Bed and a Chair, A New York Love Affair, co-starring with Bernadette Peters, Jeremy Jordan, and Cyril Ami. Please welcome Mr. Norm Lewis. <laughs> You, Thank sir. you. Thank you. Hi. This is your life, wow. Norm Lewis. Yes. <laughs> well, you were reading all that stuff, and I was like, wow, that's me. Did okay. I do that? Yeah, did I do that? Well, hi there. Hi. Hey, Tina. <laughs> you got some fans here yeah. today. So I saw you last week in the Sondheim Marsalis um, Encores event, A Bed in a Chair. Absolutely wonderful. The whole show was terrific. What was it like working on that show? Well, uh, we didn't know what we were doing. John Doyle uh, and uh, the, the people over at Encores put this together, and they, they picked the songs, and they tried to make this into a story. Um, and every day, John Doyle said, I have no idea what this is going to be. I have no idea what the orchestrations are going to sound like. I have no, if this is going to work or not. But they just wanted to try this uh, collaboration, and uh, it turned out to be a jewel. Yeah. And you got to work with Stephen Sondheim again. Yes, yes. Was he around during the rehearsal process, and did you do one-on-ones with him? It, uh, just a little bit. Um, he, would, he would come around definitely when we had run-throughs, or at least uh, even certain scenes, and he would help us with the interpretation of the song. We were, John wanted to specifically not give the same interpretation of the song from the show it was from, but use it in this context of uh, what our show was. But uh, Stephen was definitely there to say, okay, I want this note to be this note, these words to be that word, and yeah. So what was it like having him there? He's very succinct, he's very mm -hmm. specific of what he wants, right? He gives you like a word or two that really sets you on your path, doesn't right. he? Right, yeah, it was, it was great. Uh, but he was very uh, open to this jazz thing, and you should have seen him at the Zitz Probe. He was like, okay, <laughs> yeah, he was smiling a lot and shaking his head, he was like, I like that. But he definitely wanted... Uh, to make sure that people didn't take away from what he did and, and make sure the song was recognizable. Yeah. You all tackled material that you hadn't done before. What right. was that like? It was uh, challenging because we only had two weeks. And usually at Encores, it's a, uh, 
you get to use your books, uh, you know, to have the uh, the notebook on stage with you. But this was, they wanted it definitely to be memorized. And with Stephen Sondheim, it's a little challenging anyway, uh, <laughs> because the words are sometimes screwed up. I, a lot of my songs were lists of things, and everybody says don't, everybody says don't. I, I was unfortunate with the whole everybody says don't situation, because every one of them had everybody says don't, everybody says don't. I had everybody says no, everybody says stop. Everybody says can't, everybody says wait. And if I screwed that up, I could have screwed up the entire song. So uh, I had to really concentrate. There was times on stage I would turn around and go over my lyrics as someone else was singing. I was like, please let me not mess up, uh, mess up my words. So. And working with this cast, I mean, Bernadette Peters, Jeremy Jordan. I'm sorry, Jordan, yeah, I'm sorry. Her, yeah. Oh, right, yeah, she was the curly haired, yeah, yeah, yeah. The pretty lady with the yeah, curly, curly hair. Yeah, curly hair, yeah, 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 that's who it is. So talk about working with them, creating this with this cast. Well, I've admired Jeremy Jordan since I've met him uh, last year, and just, I think that he's probably has, he probably has one of the best voices I've heard, and especially for the young people that are coming up now. And he's such a great guy, and we become good friends. Um, Surreal Ami, is someone I don't did you guys get a chance to see the show she's a, uh, a a jazz artist so this was the first time for her to be on a theatrical stage and she was a little intimidated but we made her feel very comfortable and she started kind of playing with us a lot and um, now she kind of wants to do this more but she has this uh, great interpretation of jazz and uh, if you get a chance go to Birdland she's there a lot um, Bernadette Peters she's a legend uh, uh, I went up to her and I said, I, out of all the great work that you've done over the years, I've admired all of that, but what brings, what makes me smile every time I see you is the fact that I grew up with variety shows, and she did a lot of those variety shows, especially Carol Burnett, which was one of my favorites. So I just have memories of her being on that show and, and being a beautiful woman and having a crush on her, and I got to hug her and be in bed with her <laughs> <laughs> in front of people. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Working with John Doyle, what that whole experience oh. was like. Because this was very organic. Like yeah. you said, no one knew what this was going to be, and you had such a short window yeah. to put it together. He's brilliant. He's very, he's a very, I call him the quiet storm, because he was just, he kept thinking, and he kept thinking, and all of a sudden he would bust out with like, okay, this is what this means, this is where this fits. And he gave us what his interpretation of the way he wanted the arc of the show to go, and uh, we just trusted him. We, it, it, you don't say that a lot, but I, could, I would love to work with him again and uh, cuz i trust him with uh, being in any production yeah you all just seemed so free and open to anything as an audience member watching this show mm -hmm. I mean, it was really interesting to watch that yeah it was what was uh, another thing that john uh, i don't want to say made us do but had us look into we were presenting the songs you know like we like we knew them uh, from uh, the history of where they come from but when we did our zitch probe it was interesting to watch the band even though they didn't know the music but they were very cool and laid back and john said okay that was one major note he wanted to give us he wanted us to be very cool and laid back to match the band because if we were frantic it would have just been kind of a dichotomy up, up there so being such a short experience what was the best part of it for you with working on this sunday night when it was over <laughs> yeah no i kid you um no, it was, you know, as, as stressful as it was, it was very, you know, enlightening and, and I got to learn some songs I'd never heard before and, um, and just to get to work with Wynton Marsalis, you know, and his band. I was, at, again, at the Zitz Probe and after trying to memorize the songs and memorize the notes and trying to get the intention of what they, they mean, I happened to look up at the Zitz Probe and I was like, wow. That's Wynton Marsalis playing, and I'm singing with him. Dude, I'm awesome. Yeah. Uh, this was such a great experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to go back to the beginning, because you were raised in Eatonville, Florida. Yes. Where did your love for performing begin, and what were your early creative outlets? Um, well, uh, I, I tell this story a lot, but if you, if you go fall asleep if you've heard this. But... Um, I grew up in the church, and my dad was a, a, a deacon, a uh, high, very high deacon in the church. My grandfather was a preacher, so I basically lived in church. And when I gave my life to Jesus at nine, uh, I joined the church. You know, I became a member of the church and an active member. But that meant that you uh, actually sang in the choir, whether you could sing or not. And 
uh, it just, you made a joyful noise, whether it was not really that joyful or not. But I joined the choir, and it was great for me because it was a very, it was a social outlet as well. A lot of my friends were in the, in the choir. Um, but I just kept singing. I kept singing throughout the years, but I never was told that I had a voice. I was, I just sang in, in church, and I never had a solo. Not until my junior year in high school did I realize I had something. I, I decided to get into choir in school, and then that's when I started getting the accolades. And um, I was like, wow, okay. And people started applauding, and it kind of became infectious. So uh, I went off to college, majored in economics, but still dipped my toe into um, performing. And even after college, I worked in advertising for five years, but I still dipped my toe in performing. And uh, there were certain contests in, in Florida that were very much like Star Search. You guys remember Star Search? Um, and I won f a few, I lost a few, but one in particular that I won, there was a, a guy in the audience who was a, a, a producer for a cruise ship, and he asked me if I'd like to sing on his cruise, and that's what kind of started me into this business. So. Because I was going to say, what was that defining moment when you said, I want to be an actor, or I want to be a singer? It, it was actually that moment, and my uh, luckily I had a great boss, and she said, you don't want to be 85 years old saying coulda, woulda, shoulda, so go for it. If it doesn't work out, you can always come back, but go for it and try it. And so was that I, when you were at the Sentinel in yeah, Florida, the Orlando newspaper? Sen yeah, yeah. So you sold advertising, I right? sold uh, Orlando Sentinel Classified. This is Norman. Can I help you? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah. you, you probably did really well on yeah, the phone, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what got you to New York? Uh, working on the cruise ship, I met people who were who had been on Broadway or who were uh, working actors from New York, and they encouraged me because I was going to, after my stint, I only did four months, and I said, okay, what I'm going to do is go back to Orlando, go back to school for about uh, two years, and then move to New York and try to hone this craft. And one guy who I was very intimidated by. He died this year, actually, and I give him praise, Michael Carroll. Um, he told me, and forgive my language, he said, that's some bullshit. So he said, move to New York. He said, you have the talent, you saved your money, because you never spent money when you were on there. Move to New York, learn your craft there, and audition. And that's what I did. I took his advice, and I moved here. Uh, unfortunately, my father became ill a month after I got here, so I went home to be with him, to help him uh, with his transition, and then I helped my mother for another few months, like nine months, uh, with his business, because he owned a company, so I, we had to dissolve his company. And after I couldn't do any more, I moved back to New York, and that was back in 89. Um, and I've been very blessed and lucky, because again, I didn't have the training, but I had the, um, I guess I had the energy, and I wanted to, I went to everything. Uh, unless they specifically asked for blonde hair, blue eyes, and boobs, I you showed up. I showed up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because there's a magical date that means a lot to you. What is it, September 28th? Yeah, wow. Dude. See, what can I say? <laughs> I can't tell you who's running the world, but I can tell you when Norm Lewis arrived in New York. Wow, wow. Okay, so one of your, when you first got to New York, you had a Lucky Audition song too, right? That yeah. you used a lot. Yeah, I, uh, in fact, Seth Rudetsky, I don't know if you guys know him, but he picks on me all the time. I went in, uh, I, when I knew I was coming here, I only knew that we had 16 bars to prove yourself. So I had, I had finished doing Hello Dolly maybe like six months before I moved here and in the chorus of the song before the parade passes by is the baritone which is the melody and I said on stage I said wow this would be a great audition song no one else another guy is going to sing this so that's what I did I brought it up here and I brought him the vocal chart <laughs> and he just started like he said what the hell is this and then he said it was the best audition he'd ever seen. So I started using that, and I, I think I got almost every show that year. In fact, I will say this. Uh, uh, I'm not self-indulgent. I try not to be. But uh, one of my auditions was to try to get a part, and funny thing happened on the way to the forum, and that was in Atlantic City, and I got the part of a protean, and I, <laughs> and I was working with Nipsey Russell. And... <laughs> God rest his soul. But uh, he was at my audition, and he stood up and applauded after my audition. So I was like... All right, so I want to talk about that. Was that one of those 90-minute abridged versions where yes. you were doing them in? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Nipsey Russell, I think, was one of the funniest guys on TV. Yeah, <laughs> he so was. What was it like to work with? It was interesting because, uh, you know, I knew him from Car 54 and also Match Game, whatever year it yep. was at the time. And this man with this amazing smile who had these limericks. And, um, but he was also very shy. Um, uh, one of the first things, 
I saw him do, because we were there a little earlier than he, he came to us uh, for our rehearsal, but he was still doing a show in Atlantic City, and I was expecting these limericks to come out, these, you know, G-rated, but they were not. Uh, it was, he, had a, he had a pretty blue show. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. I love that. The ones on TV do one thing. Yeah. They're, they're nightclub act or something totally yeah. different. Just like Saget, uh, the guy from uh, yeah, Bob Saget. Bob yeah. Saget yeah. No one ever knew that. Yeah. Until they, you know, they'd bring their families <laughs> to see him like at these casinos and be like, oh my God. Yeah, take exactly. The kids take out. the kids out. <laughs> you know. How did you get your equity card? I did a show, a TYA, a theater for young audiences. Uh, it was a tour of a show called uh, um, uh, Four Score and Seven Years Ago. And it was actually a really good show. It wasn't like one of these, like, you know, uh, we're just going to entertain these little kids. It was a show about a runaway slave who ran to the North, and uh, he worked for this woman. Did I say North with an F? I think I did. <laughs> North. <laughs> Tina, don't pick on me. Um, anyway, I just had to clarify that. But, um, uh, but he ran away to the North, and uh, he worked for this woman, and he saw in the newspaper that they were recruiting for uh, soldiers uh, to fight for the North, and um, he wanted to join, and that was the story of him joining and fighting for, uh, for freedom. So it was a really good story. We traveled um, the eastern seaboard uh, we didn't fly because we they were too cheap, but we drove down, which was horrifying. But um, but I bet you had a really good time. I had a great time, and these uh, we went we performed for kids from kindergarten on up to college, actually, and they were very they enjoyed it. So your first big professional job, I saw you at the Gateway Playhouse with my <laughs> aunt when you did Once on This Island. Okay, that kills me. Yeah, know, right. That's so funny. That's why it's great to be from Long Island. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I loved that show so much. I was dating a young lady in the Broadway company, and uh, I luckily ended up getting a chance to do the first regional production, and uh, I was so happy to play Agwe, the god of water. But uh, I had seen it nine times, so I really wanted to be in that show. And they had auditions for the national tour, which I came close to getting, but I didn't get, but I got this. And then from that, some people were leaving the national tour, and I ended up getting on the national tour for the last two and a half, three months. Yeah, with yeah. Tina Fabri. Yeah. Who's here? Who's here? I Welcome. keep going to Tina. Hi, sorry. So they were great shows at Gateway. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's happened? Are they still there? I don't know. Yeah, they are still there. Are I they? Think they're still there. That's my aunt. Okay. So you're at Thanksgiving. They're still okay. there, right, Gateway? Okay. So I want to talk about that. Was Did you meet Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty then or on the tour? I met him on, God, when did I, I think I met him on the tour. I don't think they came to the see gateway. this. I don't think they came to Gateway. I'm not sure. It was a little sad because um, it was a 500 seat house at Gateway and um, <laughs> the, Gateway was used to having My Fair Lady, you know, the, the classics come there. Once on this island, people didn't know. So out of a 500 seat house, I think the largest crowd we had was like 100. Um, and that was opening night. Oh God! Um, so people weren't used to that. So they lost money. But even it was it, it was a great production. Yeah, yeah. It was beautiful. Yeah. Well, you played to the hundred best people. To you the best people. Yeah, exactly. For. So you made your Broadway debut in the Who's Tommy. Yes. And a lot of people made their debuts in that show. Yeah, it was a great cast. There's nothing like a debut. What are your memories of doing Tommy and being a part of that company and being uh, a part of that show? Wow. Um, I remember being so green and the uh, first day of rehearsal, everybody was introducing themselves. And I said, I'm Norm Lewis and I'm overwhelmed. And um, um, I just excited to go to work every day, um, knowing that I had a Broadway show. I made it. And um, the cast, they were, we, we, we're still close now, even after 20 years. It's so funny how it was just so cohesive. Um, yeah, I wish I could explain it. It's just, it's, it's, it's ephemeral, actually. Uh, um, Sherry Renee Scott, Michael Cerverus, Michael McElroy. A lot of people, I realized the other night, we had a Rockers on Broadway and celebrating the 20 years and celebrating 20 years of Rockers on Broadway as well. Um, there were at least five people who have been nominated uh, for Tonys and then I think three people who have won Tony Awards from that cast. So, yeah, we were pretty special. 
you probably all bonded together, the ones yeah. that were making their debut, right? Yeah, yeah. The debut club. The debut club. You know what? Maybe that's what we should have, the debut club. The debut yeah. club. Yeah. But I mean, Pete Towson was around all the yeah, time. Yeah, it was funny. He was such a cool, you know, you've known him for being this rocker, but he was such a cool guy and was so dedicated to making sure that it was a, a Broadway show and the story was being told. Um, that was, that happened to be the only show that my mom got to see me do on Broadway before she passed. She passed a year later. But she came to opening night and she was sitting down and she was so cute because P Pete had a couple of drinks that night and he was walking by and I said, Pete, come here, I want you to meet my mom. And so he sat down and he was very nice to her and my mom said, are you Mr. Who? <laughs> <laughs> And he looked at me and I said, yeah, just tell her. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you Mr. Who? That's classic. Yeah. Because that was a, an amazing season. Those two big shows were yeah. right across the street. It was Kiss of a Spider Woman right, right. and The Who. And you guys are like hang pictures like, welcome to your opening night, welcome oh, yeah. to our opening night. Yeah, yeah. Those are the two big shows that season. We got tr in trouble too because um, uh, Donnie Kerr yeah. was getting married to Lisa Mordente, who was our assistant choreographer. Her mom is Sheeta Rivera. So we had access to go over yeah. to the, and so in, during, in, during our intermission, we would go over there and say hi a lot in our costumes. Yeah. <laughs> Got in trouble. They were like, get out. Get out. Get out. <laughs> you next appeared on Broadway as John in yes. the Alain Bobile and Claude Michel Schoenberg musical Miss Saigon. Yes. How did that role happen for you? That one was, I had auditioned for them a couple of times before. And interestingly enough, I, the same, I got, both shows, Tommy and Miss Saigon, the same week. And I had chose Tommy because it was a new show. Um, even though I was going to play a lead, I said, let me just hold off because this is a new show. It's fine. And, you know, if that never happens again, it happened one time. Um, but even Vinny Liff, I don't know if anyone remembers Vinny Liff, amazing man. Uh, he was part of Johnson Liff. Uh, casting, he said, you know what, you need to do Tommy, and then we'll, Miss Saigon will be here. And a year later, I ended up getting in the show. Wow. Yeah, I, got, I went to Toronto for six months and then came back to Broadway. Well, so you started in Toronto, and mm -hmm. that's when you really seriously trained your voice, right? Yeah. The vocal coach up there? Good God, man, how do you know this stuff? <laughs> Just yeah. comes out. I was, I was 30, and um, I decided uh, if I'm gonna do this business, I might as well really hone in on it. And I found an opera coach up there and I started coaching with him while I was there. And then he, he directed me to a guy that he worked with down in New York when I transferred back. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So who put you in the show? Who directed you in Miss uh, A guy named Fred Hansen. He was the reg uh, regional director at the time. And, um, is that right? Resident director. And um, who hired me though was Richard Jay because he was an executive producer on the show. So we have a long history. Yeah, we're gonna get into him, but yeah. did you work with Richard during Miss Saigon? No, no, he was just responsible for me, you know, being a, a part of it and getting me into the audition. Yeah. Yeah. Stunning score for Miss Saigon and that beautiful song you got to sing yeah. about the children left behind in yeah. Vietnam. Talk it, about the song. Bui Doi, it was, uh, I did a lot of research on, on Vietnam, you know, before I got into the show and uh, I actually dedicated this to my cousin because he happens to be uh, a soldier that fought in Vietnam and he fathered three children uh, from a Vietnamese woman and brought her back. So it was kind of interesting that it was, you know, I had that story with me. Um, but it was, it was, you know, the footage, I don't know if you ever saw it, but the footage was actual footage of these kids who, if they're mixed race, they were put into an orphanage. They weren't considered, you know, they were the lowest of lows. So my character was trying to fight for them to be brought over, you know, for fathers to go back and claim them. It was a very emotional show, but, uh, but rewarding because it bought my house. <laughs> See? I've always asked, clap, that's it. Get the big show. Get a TV commercial, you buy a house. But that was like the biggest mm. show, one mm -hmm. of the most emotional, one of the biggest musicals ever to hit Broadway. Right. And I'm sure to be, it was such a spectacle with the helicopter and yeah. film work and just the emotional impact it had with the audience. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, the, you know, uh, with everything uh, that goes wrong, sometimes the helicopter wouldn't come in or certain things would go wrong. But it was interesting. Some people who saw it with the helicopter not working interestingly enough, liked that because they, the people ran off into the abyss. So it gave them a, an extra theatrical you know, uh, moment. 
So I was going to ask you, what did they do? Opposed saying, oh, we're going to go next door. Oh, it's over there. <laughs> so no, they ran? No, they would run, we would run into the abyss. You would, it would uh, literally run into a, like this darkness, and then we would run off stage. So, um, yeah, they would just say, we're going to cut the, we're gonna cut the helicopter. Cut the helicopter. Oh, I'm sure it worked beautifully. Yeah, yeah. There was a couple of times where uh, the helicopter got stuck, and <laughs> it would stay in this next scene <laughs> and stay in the next scene. And it was one time it was in the hotel room, so... Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. But we just kept going. We just kept... Live theater. It's sort of like just one of those memory kind of things, like, it, it never leaves, right? <laughs> well, then you played Eddie the Boxer in one of my favorite musicals, in Michael John Lacuse's daring and dark musical, The Wild Party. Yeah. I mean, that was opposite Tony Collette, Mandy Patinkin, the legendary Eartha Kitt. Eartha Kitt, yeah. 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 Well, let's talk about Eartha first. What was it like working with Eartha Kitt? You know, it's, it was interesting, because you, know, you grow up knowing her as Catwoman, or you know her from her club shows, or being, you know, her, even her controversy that she went through. Um, such a down-to-earth woman, and I used to call her Eartha May, you know, just because I wanted her to feel comfortable. You know, I didn't want her to think that I was just admiring her because she was a legend. And I got to know her very well, and uh, I would go up to her home and have food and, and uh, holidays and stuff like that with her. Um, so it was a treat to be with her and get to know her. Uh, Tony Collette was new on the scene, but you know had this powerhouse of, of stuff happening. You know, she had uh, the, the scary movie, I See Dead People, uh, Six Sense, thank you. And, uh, and also- They're very smart, they know everything. Yeah, exactly. Audience. Thank you for helping me. Uh, and also Shaft was coming out that, that same time. And um, she's, she was just this, a, someone who was new to the Broadway stage, but didn't f seem intimidated by it. And uh, I just loved watching her do her craft on stage. Man to be taken, another legend, and um, a powerhouse. I, I loved watching him do his thing when he was by himself. And even when he was in blackface, which I love that George uh, made him do, uh, because that's what the character was about. Um, and that whole cast was just fun. And working with George C. Wolf. Yeah. Was it a dream come true? Legend. What makes him such a great director? I think, well, he, first of all, he's so smart. He's just smart. That's another person you trust. Uh, I mean, even with the flops that he's had, quote unquote, the flops he's had, he's just, he's a smart, smart man. And uh, he cares about what the actor is bringing to the role. Um, and 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 the the show as a as a whole, so um, and he will make you rehearse over and over and over again, and he he picked on me a lot um, because I had to wear a gold tooth, and so he would call me to certain names, uh, um, but yeah, it was just it, it, you trust him. He's just a really smart man. Yeah, your character was so fiery and angry mm -hmm. and pented up energy. You worked out a lot during that show. That's really yeah. when you got buffed and everything, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I lost it. But yeah, yeah. Uh, so how did you do both of that? How did you sort of train to play the role and get through eight shows a week? Well, I, I wanted to be authentic, and uh, I did this thing called Body for Life. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that or not, but it transforms you in 12 weeks. I'm like, yeah, let me just try it. I'll see if it works. But I had to be a boxer, so... Um, it just gave me some discipline uh, for that show, and uh, it really, really helped. And it, one of the best compliments I got was someone was in the back of the, of the balcony, and they didn't say anything about my singing or acting. They said, I saw all six of your abs, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like... Yeah. Um, you played to the last row of the I balcony. I played to the last row. Boom, boom, boom. But did you love playing that role? I did, I did. And working with Leah Hawking, uh, she was my wife. I got to beat her every night. Not that I'm into beating women, but... Uh, <laughs> But, but, but she was like, hit me, hit me. Just, you know, make sure this, is, this looks authentic. And it was just great to get in, into this character because we based it on Jack, jo Jack uh, Johnson. Uh, and he actually had a gold tooth and he was a very educated man. So I, uh, this was back in the 20s, uh, 1928. Um, so the anger comes from, even though he had a white wife, he still was not accepted uh, into certain worlds. And, uh, and he was, even though he was a star, he still was not accepted in certain worlds. So there was a lot of pent up anger. And uh, so I just tried to use um, the history that I, I learned from that, from his, uh, his, his history. Looking back, why do you think the show failed? Why do you think it didn't find an audience? It was, you know, it's funny because people, 
I have a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in 20 years who came to see the show, and she has a master's degree in music and a master's degree in psychology. And she said, you know, the only reason why people don't like this show is because they don't understand it. In, in the sense of not calling them anyone dumb, but people don't want to face certain things. The Wall Party, if you have seen it or have read the book, it's people go to a party and they wear their masks as they walk in saying, hey, how are you? You look great. That dress is great. Oh, I love your hair. All that kind of stuff. But as the alcohol and the drugs start getting in, you feel a little bit more comfortable and you get looser and things start happening. And then it becomes like this, you know, sometimes you've, I don't know if you've ever been to a party where you've just seen someone who was falling down drunk and you're just like, okay, I got to get out of here. I think that that's what it was. Because uh, you weren't just an audience member, you were actually someone who came to the party. Yeah, maybe a lot of people saw themselves in some of these people. Probably, yeah. You know, and yeah. sometimes shows are ahead of their time. And, right, right. And there was the dual wild parties going on too. That was fun. I actually liked it, and yeah. there was a rumor that they were going to move across the street from us. But uh, <laughs> I, I liked a uh, Andrew Lippa's version as well because it was more accessible. Um, and I think Michael John's. Uh, as brilliant as he is, I think a lot of times his music is not as accessible as some people would like, so that could be another factor. Sure. Amour is that beautiful little musical that you did written by Michelle Legrand. Michelle Legrand, yeah. And Michelle Legrand, that's my, my second friend for the day. <laughs> and James Lapine. Yeah. You played yeah. painter. Yeah, I was the painter. How did that project come about for you, and what attracted you to that? Well, James and I have been friends for a while, and I've, I, I, I did a couple of projects with him. I did a workshop... <laughs> of a musical called Muscle. I can see why he would cast you in that. I wasn't the muscle guy, though. It was Jared Himmick. Um, but it was, it was very fun. Anyway, uh, cut to, um, I did a workshop of, it was at the time called La Passe Mirai. I'm, not, uh, if I'm bastardizing the French, but um, they changed the name when it came to Broadway to Amour, just to make it more, again, more accessible so people could say it. Um, but it was a, a show that was very well received in Paris. But the French sensibility is different than the American sensibility. So what James did is he tried it out in the workshop and then through the process before it came to New York, rearranged certain songs. And he made the storyline actually work. Um, it was, uh, someone called it like this effervescent sort of uh, musical because it wasn't anyone hitting any high C's or belting out any big notes or anything. It was just a sweet, sweet story based on a fable from France. And uh, it just, I think it was too small for the Broadway stage. It probably would have worked off Broadway. Um, yeah. Because yeah. everybody who I know who saw it and worked on it said mm -hmm. it's one of their favorite shows. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun to work on. And uh, the the producers were so behind it. They, they really wanted it to work, but... It, you know, the, there was a rumor that we were going to close, and they said, no, we're not going to close. We're going to make it through. And then a week later, our notice came up. So, But another great cast. I mean, Malcolm Getz, Melissa Errico. Talk about your cast and yeah. working with them. Chris Fitzgerald, uh, yeah. Louis Cleal. Yeah. Uh, also, Christian Borrell was a swing in the show. And now he's a big-time Tony Award winner and a TV star. Um, it was, uh, you know, we both, we were all kind of going through the fire. Nora, Nora Mae Ling, I don't know if you know that name or sure. not. Um, but we were all just going through the fire trying to figure out what this show was going to be and trying to figure out our songs and, and our blocking and stuff. And just fell in love with each other, as you do, you know, with any cast. Sure. Yeah. Another major turn for you where audiences and critics both sat up and took notice is when you created the role of Jake in the Bill Russell and Henry Krieger musical, Sideshow. Sideshow, About yeah. the Siamese twins. Yeah, let's hear it. Brilliant musical about Daisy and Violet Hilton. How did you view the show then, and how do you view the show now? I, that's a good question. God, you're good at this. Uh, uh, I viewed, the, I was, I knew that we were in something special. Uh, I know it was based on a true story. My character out of the leads was the only character that was fictional. Um, and I had auditioned for the workshop, but I didn't get it because they said I was too leading man. And then they changed their mind when it came to Broadway. So I was very happy about that. But the music, Henry Krieger, come on, um, you know, Dream Girls and the other shows that he's worked on. But um, I got the Jennifer Holiday song. The, <laughs> you did, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but. <laughs> 
it, it, it may have been, you know, the, some of the critics were saying that it just wasn't dirty enough. It wasn't uh, carnival enough. It needed to be, you know, scarier. And then some people were saying that we needed to bring the love story out more. Um, you can't really satisfy a lot of people, yeah. but I know that our, our reviews, all of our reviews actually were good. And uh, we just didn't open, I think, at the right time. We opened the same season as Scarlet Pimpernel, Lion King, and Ragtime. And we opened before they did. So um, we were hoping that we were going to get like spillover. You know, anybody who couldn't get into those shows could come <laughs> to our show. But I, they were, our producers were relying on our, our, our reviews to sell the show and word of mouth. And there just wasn't a lot of marketing. Like, for, for instance, Scarlet Pimpernel didn't get the best reviews, but I guess they had so much money behind them on their wall, the wall that looked like that, that big. Or the uh, New York Times could have said outrageously bad, but what they did was outrageous dot, 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 New York Times. And so that told a lot of the... Um, the tourists, when they got here, ooh, this show's outrageous. The New York Times says it, so let's go see it. So we didn't have that. It took us two months to put anything we had, and it was a like a sandwich board. It was about as big as this in front of the theater. So, yeah. You know, the interesting thing is, working from a media standpoint, when we, when we got to cover the show, mm -hmm. the poster was very strange, because, you know, I view, like, my family when they buy tickets, and they were like, I didn't know what it was. It just right. said Sideshow. And yet, I think the week before you closed, they took either a full page or a double full page color ad in the New York Times with the most stunning photographs of the girls in the clothes, and it just looked like a big, gorgeous, splashy musical. Right. Right. And no one knew going into it what it was unless you went to see it. Yeah, it's all about marketing. It really yeah. is. This is show business, and that's when I learned that it was show business, you know. You know, yeah. it's like you have to give something away to sell tickets. Right. They, they know they're Siamese twins. Show them in these gorgeous clothes. Right. Show them in the carnival numbers. Right, right. But you had a great time working on that, I right? I did. I did. It was one of the best uh, experiences I've ever had. In fact, people kept asking me because they're getting ready to bring it back, I think. I know that they're doing it in La Jolla and they're going to go to Kennedy Center and hopefully bring it to Broadway. They kept asking me, would I be interested in doing it? And I said, well, first of all, I'm a little long in the tooth to play that part. But. I think I wouldn't do it anyway, even if it was offered, because it was such a moment in my life that I want to treasure, and I wouldn't want to touch that. So. Yeah. I recently interviewed Billy Porter in your chair, and we talked about the impact. Yes. It's the star I chair. feel it. I feel, I feel the it. energy. Feel yes. Energy. Exactly. <laughs> We talked about the impact that the musical Dream Girls had on him, both personally and professionally, mm -hmm. and it's had quite an impact on you too. You've done the show a few times. Yeah, right? yeah. Give and me your history with Dream Girls. I, the very first time I ever even knew about Dream Girls, I was in college, and uh, the guys in my dorm would knock. They came and knocked on my door. They knew that I was interested in musical theater because I'd done some shows. And they said, wake up, Norm, wake up. And um, they said, you gotta see this woman, you gotta see this woman. So I got up out of bed, and I, it was Saturday Night Live, and it was the very first time that they ever had someone who was not a musical, you know, like recording artist, be their guest on uh, the show. And it was Jennifer Holliday singing, And I'm Telling You. And I was like, wow, who, who is she? So I found out who she was, and then started doing a little more research on that show and what was happening. and. Um, and then I bought the album, and then it became, you know, it won her a Grammy for the song, and so I've always loved it. Um, and then, f you know, cut to years later being here, Seth Rudetsky had a benefit concert uh, at Don't Tell Mamas for a, a gay synagogue. It was something I'd never heard of before. <laughs> um, it was a, a, a lesbian rabbi, and they were raising funds for the anyway for the synagogue. So um, they decided to do Dream Girls, and Lilius White, and I played Curtis, and there was a bunch of people. And from that, that sparked an idea in him to do it with the Actors Fund. And I got a chance to learn the music and learn the material and really hone in on it. And to get to be with Audra McDonald and Heather Headley and Lilius White, um, such a great cast. And that night, it was right after 9/11, yeah. and so we needed it in New York. And there was. Everybody who was anybody was in that theater and um, turned out to be a glorious night. But from that, I knew that Jennifer Holliday was getting ready to uh, have it in Atlanta and she was going to star in it. And I, I, I couldn't get an audition because <laughs> I think she had a little thing against the, the concert yeah. not being a part of it. But finally I got in and we connected and I got to play with her. 
uh, for a couple of weeks down in Atlanta, Georgia at the Fox Theater. And I just know that through the, because it was such a short period of time that we were rehearsing, I was getting my lines and getting my blocking. And then all of a sudden we did the, the fight scene. And I had never seen Jennifer Holliday do it except for on television at the Tony Awards. So that's when I had this moment like, oh my God, this woman's going to eat me alive right now. This is the moment that I know. It's like, oh, wow. And I started getting nervous, but it was really cool. And she was so gracious and we had a great time. And my family is from Florida and Alabama. So I had about 100 people that came to see me do it in Atlanta, Georgia with her. So, Terrific time yeah, for you. Yeah. Oh. Another legendary musical that has played a major part in your career is another Alain Bobile and Claude Michel Schoenberg musical, Les Miserables. Y Yes. Now, you've done this show a few times, A couple too. of times, yeah. 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 Let's start with the revival on Broadway in 2006. Um, again, I had auditioned for uh, Javert years before, um, and that was actually, that was another thing that got me into Miss Saigon earlier. But um, uh, they remembered that, and Cla uh, Cameron McIntosh called and said, how would you like to be in the revival? And I said, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I was the first African-American to play the part on Broadway. Thank you, thank you so much. I wasn't the first black to play it, but because it was a black guy in London, but I was the first African American. Um, but, uh, oh, and also I was the longest John on Broadway. Fabulous. <laughs> Take that however you want. <laughs> it all stays here. It all stays here. It all stays here. Um, no, but uh, that was great. I mean, Paul, uh, Alex Gimignani uh, playing, uh, that cast again, uh, Aaron Lazar, um, uh, what's her name? Oh my Celia God, Celia Keenan Bolger. Yes, I'm losing my mind. But yeah, it was such a great cast, and it was great to be in a show that was so legendary. I vowed one day before I even got into this business in 1987 when it was on Broadway before the Tony Awards on my birthday, June 2nd. I saw it, and I was like, "What is this show?" And I said, "I want to be in that show somehow, whether being the background or something." I just felt the connection, and 20 years later, I got to be in it, so it was great. Um, what are the challenges the first time doing him? What are the challenges of playing that role? Is it the vocal? Is it the acting? It is trying to not be robotic and being like someone else. And so I tried to erase all other memories of other Javert's. And I, I, I went to a, uh, an acting coach to actually study the words. To uh, I know it goes by very quickly, but I wanted to have the subtextual meaning. Uh, what is Javert saying in this moment? Where, where is he in this moment? Uh, what is his plight? Why is he chasing this man for 20 years? Um, so I, was, I did that from the book and also from the acting coach and, and trying to find a, a, a nice you know, storyline there. Yeah, and then you did it for a year in the UK. Was that yes. before the 25th anniversary concert? It was during. Okay. So I, I was asked by Cameron again if I'd like to do the 25th anniversary concert. And then a couple of weeks after I, we agreed on it, um, he said, how would you like to come to the West End for six months? So that's what happened. So I was doing that simultaneously, rehearsing for that, for both of them. And then after the... 25th was done, I still was in the West End, and he said, how would you like to stay another six months? And I said, yeah, because I didn't really get a chance to enjoy Europe, I just, because I was so focused on those two projects. And I said, let me just stay here, do this show, and then enjoy Europe, and that's what I did. So what was it like taking that show, playing it in London, uh, the West End? Well, you know, the history of it starting there, and, and, um, and being in a, another, a whole other country. West End is their Broadway, so it was prestigious. It was uh, I got a lot of attention, and uh, it, it just felt exciting as it was as I did my first Broadway show. I was so excited to do that, and with this special show too. So yeah, okay. So the concert was done at that O2 Arena, which right. holds thousands and thousands of people. If you, the DVD is available at Amazon. It's one of the most electrifying live concerts. Yeah. I yeah. asked Ramin Karamlu what it was like, and he said the whole evening was a blur for him. <laughs> until the curtain call. Yeah. Because, because, because you're out there, there's all these cameras rolling, and right. you want to be letter perfect and get through this thing. He said, all I remember was taking my bow. Yeah, it was about, I think there were about, I could be wrong, but I think it was like 52 cameras, yeah. you know, and they were you know, all on the floor and doing this kind of thing. But what we had to learn, we had two weeks of rehearsal 
actually two and a half weeks of rehearsal, but we couldn't look at each other. So I'm singing the confrontation like this, and Valjean is right here. So I couldn't look at him. I couldn't look at him because the mic was there and the cameras were doing this. So what they did, though, if you saw it, they faced us uh, on the on the screen. Um, so it was just relearning how to act that role. Um, but what I remember most was it was endless. So you would look down and you kept looking up and you kept looking and it was endless. It was about 20,000 people, I think. Yeah, and we did it twice that day. So it was 40,000 people. How do you perform and not get caught up in the energy that's coming your way? Because you know these people, are, you, that energy must go right through your body. Yeah. You, How do you stay focused? I have no idea. You yeah. pray. Uh, Lord, please let me make it through this without yeah. falling down. It, it, you know, we knew the show, and and but the excitement was also coming from behind us because there were 500 people on stage um, who had been in the show over the 25 years, and a lot of people were wearing just T-shirts and they just wanted to be a part of it. Um, there were people who had played Marius and lead roles, but they wanted just just to be a part of this celebration. So. And then you re-teamed with director Richard J. Alexander this past summer, because yeah. you did the role again at the Muni. Right, right. Which is how many people are at the Muni? 10,000. All right, so 10,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where do you play? When you look out into an audience, what, who do you play to? You, um, you try to reach that guy that's way, way, way up top. And you just, because it is such a big stage, um, you can get away with that. Um, and Richard was, I didn't realize, because I've never worked with him as a director, so I didn't realize he was a really great director, and he yeah. brought a lot of the original uh, blocking, uh, the original orchestrations, um, and some, he gave us little insights and secrets to what happened in the original company, and so we used that. But we also, he hired um, kids who were like 18, 19, and 20 to play students, so they were the authentic age, they were the actual age. So I was going to ask you, what was it like working with him as a director? Because he has such a passion for this piece, mm -hmm. and you have such a short window. Because you're rehearsing in some other area of the Muni while the show is on. Right, right. Uh, it was uh, Nonsense? Was it Nonsense? Yeah, I think Nonsense was playing. Uh, or, wait. South Pacific? South Pacific, yeah. yeah. Nonsense, and then South Pacific, and then us. Um, so, yeah, you just you don't know until that night. We do... Um, if you know theater at all, you have to do a, a tech rehearsal, and it's they call it 10 out of 12s. Well, we didn't get there until, I think, 12 or, or 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning in order to tech the show. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's, it's at night, so that they need the lights at night in order to do that. So they had to wait till the very final performance of South Pacific in order to do that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah so I think they... They strike South Pacific. Right. They put your show on, right. and then you rehearse during the night. Right. Yeah. But if they've done that forever. Well, and and oh, and an added ex, uh, an, an added element was the fact that they had to bring the set back. I'm, I was wrong. It's it's the yeah. They you do it the day before they end. So they <laughs> bring the entire set on of Les Mis. After we finish blocking it and staging it, and they take it off and then put. South Pacific back on so they can do their last performance. <laughs> Wonder what would happen if half of South Pacific set is on yes. and the barricade <laughs> rolled on exactly. when they were supposed to go to Bally High or something, right? Exactly. Well, you got to create another major original role, which was Nathan in the beautiful Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty musical Dessa Rose, which yeah. is at Lincoln Center. Yeah. Opposite, yeah. yeah, clap, please. I loved this show. Thank you. Opposite LaShawn's and Rachel York. Yes, yes. I got to kiss on Rachel York. Yeah. I get to kiss on some really nice people. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. But that meant a lot to you professionally and personally, that show, because that was a slave story I knew nothing about. Yeah, we didn't know anything yeah. about it either and until we read the book. And uh, a beautiful, beautiful story. It was, uh, if you don't know it, it's, a, it's these slaves who basically were helped by a white man, uh, a white, actually this white woman, but I brought the, uh, the, the scheme to this white woman and she helps us. What we do is we go to town to town and we sell, she will sell us and then that night we will escape and meet somewhere and then we'll go to the next town and so we raise money that way. So that helped us raise money to get to not necessarily the north but the west where there also slaves were, uh, people, blacks were uh, free to, to live as well. 
So you got to work hands on with Lynn and Steven during right. that. Yeah. And Graziella Danielle Graziella, was your yeah. director choreographer. Yes. What yes. was that whole team like to work with? Well, you know, the, the legend that Graziella is, even with Once on the Silent and even A New Brain, that I had a tiny window to work with her on that. Um, she just is amazing and and even with her cute little accent she's just so smart she's another again another smart director and um she does her homework um she knew about the slaves she knew exactly where they came from what ship they were on things like that um so you trusted her lynn and steve i mean what can you say their music is is just so beautiful to sing and then they work with your voice and to make you uh, sound as wonderful as you can to interpret what their, their lyrics are. Yeah. No, because Graziella was a dancer. She was the mm -hmm. original not guilty in the original Chicago with right. Cheetah and Gwen. Right, right. So I just love when directors come from the stage. They understand how actors and performers really work. Right, and she knows how to make people who are not necessarily dancers yeah move and look good even even if they don't have choreography but staging she she knows how to make them look good you also got to play Cole House Walker right in ragtime right Right. Where did you do that and talk about that role? I did that in North Carolina, um, and I got to, Joe Locara was the director. He was a, an original company member in uh, the original Broadway version of Ragtime. So he directed it down in North Carolina, and I was blessed to get to play that role. I've auditioned for the show. I had a brief history with that show uh, of trying to get into the major production of it, but uh, it just never worked out. But I got this opportunity, so I was so happy to do that. Yeah. yeah. You got to do two Candor and Ebb shows. You played Billy Flynn on Broadway in right. Chicago. And then you appeared in the review, First You Dream, the music of Candor and Ebb at the Signature Theater. Right, right. You know, there's like 292 seats at the Signature, right? Right, right. This is amazing. They had a 19-piece orchestra right. on, stage on stage with all of you. Right, right. What was it like singing the music of Candor and Ebb and working with John Candor, who is a dear friend of mine who I absolutely adore. So talk about the one-on-one -on -one sessions you had with John Candor. One of the sweetest guys in the world. He gets so emotional <laughs> every time you sing one of his songs. He's just, he's so brilliant. Um, uh, and uh, again, so smart. I never got to work, you know, meet uh, Fred Ebb, but uh, John Candor just brought his essence and his spirit to this whole process. Um, it was great working down in, in Arlington again because I got to play Sweeney Todd down there 10 years prior, um, even though it was a different facility. But uh, the 19 piece orchestra was loud, but fun to work with because they were, they were also part of the cast as well because they got to do things. Um, but there were six of us, three women, three, three guys, and we just bonded and that music, legendary, legendary. I mean, it was kind of like what we just did with the bed and a the chair. There were these different songs, but we tried to interpret them in the way that it fit into that show. So, See, like their songs are all mini stories. Right. They tell it. A, a complete story. Right, right. And I'm sure sitting with John, he told you the original intent. Yeah, that was, that was, uh, yeah, that was definitely instrumental in, in helping us with interpreting each song. And uh, he would, especially I remember him working with Matthew Scott on one of the pieces that he had to sing for, um, from Kiss of the Spider Woman. And it just turned his whole performance around. He said, okay, I now I get it, I get it. What was your favorite moment in that show that you did? I remember loving the song. I never loved it before, or just it was just a song that just kind of happened. But I love doing the song "Life Is." Um, I never thought I'd ever play that role, you know, Zorba. But um, it was great singing that song. Yeah, yeah. And in the last one you just did in the Sondheim, mm -hmm. a bed in a chair. What was your favorite moment in that that you did? Because you had so many. Uh, wow. I wanted. I always wanted other people's songs. Like I wanted Jeremy Jordan's uh, "Losing My Mind." Yeah. That arrangement. Uh, <laughs> I told him. I said, "You better record that before Michael Bublé hears it, because um, it just sounded yeah. so good." Um, I also enjoyed. I, I enjoy watching people who are very fresh and new, making their debut, and watching Surreal. Just the excitement that came out of her. And I said, "You know what, New York." is gonna love you, and, yeah. uh, and they did. They really, really did. So it was m the excitement of being on stage watching that. Because I left that afternoon. I yeah. wanted to go home and sing all those songs yeah. and pretend I was French <laughs> and sing like her in my house. You know, you've worked with and on several Stephen Sondheim shows. We'll get yes. into him now. I believe beginning with the title role of Sweeney Todd in 1999, right. which was a signature, right? Right, right. So that was the first time you played Sweeney, and then you did him 10 years later? Right, I did it at Casa Manana. Uh, I love the name of that. 
Is that theater? Yeah, Casa Manana. Casa Manana. Is it a dinner theater that sells serves Mexican food? <laughs> I said, if they, they, no, it's a beautiful theater out there. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. It is, yeah. When I first heard, that, I said, oh, I wonder if it's a dinner theater. No, no, no. It's a I huge. Know, it's, a it's actually one, yeah. a huge theater too. Um, but uh, yeah, I had a great time doing yeah. those. So what was the experience like playing him the first time and then revisiting him 10 years later? Well, when I initially got the first audition for Sweeney Todd, I'm thinking, okay, they're going to go old with, um, with Anthony. I'm like, oh, okay, okay, I was going to go in for Anthony. But no, they were like, we want you to play Sweeney. And I said, oh, snap, okay. <laughs> okay, okay, because uh, they saw me do uh, Sideshow, and so they said, we think your voice could fit this. So. That was a great challenge to me because I have always admired this role, just never thought I'd play it. So going in and doing research on it and, um, and learning the music, and le it was difficult. And I remember one time, uh, Eric Schaefer was our director. He said, okay, you're not bringing it. Something's wrong. You, why, why, you're not bringing it. You gotta, you gotta, you, you're hitting the right notes, you're, you're doing the right blocking, but you're not giving it to me. So I want you to go home and think about something. Just think about the thing that makes you the angriest. So I said, okay, whatever. So I went home and serendipitous, there was an, uh, a documentary about the way African Americans were treated in the 60s and the dogs and the fire hoses and things like that, which pissed me off. So I brought that in the next day and he was like, I don't know what you saw, <laughs> but that was, that was what I wanted. Because he said you were too nice. I was right? too nice, yeah. He was too nice of a Sweeney. Yeah. He'll like smile <laughs> and, and cut you. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> so, what are the challenges of taking on that role? I asked George Hearn this. Mm -hmm. He said it was the vocal. It was. It's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's really for bass, uh, baritone. I mean, uh, baritone bass, whatever. And um, I'm more of a lyric baritone. So, the, another challenge was there were 18 pieces. We did it in a, 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 a garage. Uh, before Signature moved to their, their theater now, they had a garage, which was not that big. It only fit 139 people, but there were 18 pieces they wanted in this show, so 18 instruments, no microphone. So being, even though I can hit the note, I need a microphone. <laughs> and one of my reviews, actually a couple of my reviews were like, well, he just, we only could hear a little bit of his notes, even though he did a, a great job. But um, uh, I guess that was the biggest challenge, yeah, making sure that I, I didn't warm up past an F yeah. uh, because I had to stay low. Uh, if I could do it in the morning, it would have been fantastic. But um, that, would, yeah, and, and the emotional part of it, it was, it was draining. Because I was gonna say, how do you, how do you train for something? Because Sweeney's such an angry man. Like yeah. it's, it's guttural, it's angry. Where so you don't tighten your vocal cords or whatever. How right. do you vocally train? And like you say, without a microphone. Right, right. You, I, I, I had to use every ounce of whatever training I had to to try to stay as fit as I could. And I, you know, got enough rest, and I didn't do any no drinking, um, and sleep was definitely uh, a priority. Yeah. So when you revisited the role, mm -hmm. was it easier the second time? It around? was easier the second time. What was difficult was when you get older, you can't remember shit. So, um, <laughs> so I'm like, oh god, what was that? Really, I sang that? Okay, but luckily it worked out. And it was another one of those things where you 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 had to because uh, uh, Casamanyana is one of those where you have to learn it in two weeks and then do it. So um, even though I had done it before, that was ten years before. So yeah. Okay, so some stayed sort of the muscle memory. Yeah, exactly, stayed. exactly. Gotcha. So how did the roundabout Sondheim on Sondheim come about for you? Um, James, again, James Lapine. We did a, a reading workshop of it uh, a year prior, and it was, uh, it was a different cast, yeah. but uh, for some reason I, I got lucky enough to be a part of the, the Broadway company. So James kept me in mind for when it decided to go to Broadway, and just turned out to be a beautiful thing. To work with Barbara Cook, another legend, who at 80, I think she was 82 at the time, she still sounded like a little girl. Uh, Vanessa Williams, probably one of the most beautiful women in the world, and is so talented. So I was intimidated by her, even though we were friends, but I was intimidated by her. Uh, uh, Matthew Scott, Aaron, I forgot Aaron's last name, I love her. Um, is it Aaron Davey? Yeah. Dilly, there's no No, not, not Dilly. No, it's the other one. 
Oh, Davy. Maybe it is Davy. Yeah. Got, someone during this thing, if you can just go to Google and Google yeah, yeah. Sondheim on Sondheim at Roundabout. Work. Exactly. Please, someone pull yeah. it up for us. Well, I know that. I know the redhead girl. And Tom, exactly. I love her. I know yeah, she's Tom redheaded. Wolpat, yeah. Be a picture. Tom Wolpat, Ewan yeah. Morton, yeah. Leslie Kritzer. Leslie Kritzer. It was a great cast. And again, it was one of those things. I For some reason, I fall into shows that people don't know what it's going to be. Um, but it became an amalgam of... Yeah. Of a workshop, a reading, a master class, a concert, a Broadway show. I mean, it, you learn so much about this guy who everybody celebrates all the time. And he, in fact, the, he's celebrated that entire year, yeah. 80. Uh, it's a milestone. But um, that show was so, so special. Was he around? He was around a lot. One on ones yeah. for you two, giving yeah. you little notes Absolutely. and stuff? Absolutely. Yeah, because I, one in particular, I, I for years I'd been singing. Uh, being alive, and I remember normally the way I talk, somebody, like when you talk about somebody, you say somebody, and he said, I don't want you to say somebody, I want you to say somebody. So instead of somebody hold me too close, somebody hurt me too deep, it was like, somebody hurt me too deep, and I just never understood it, but then I got it when he explained it, he was like, there's a body, somebody love me, somebody hold me, you know, so I got it. See, I told you, it's those one little those thing one you. Lo- yeah, yeah. 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 Aaron Mackey. Aaron Mackey. Thank you, see? Thank you. God bless you, son. You win this water. You win. <laughs> I love the set you were on because you all, it was all those televisions that kept turning. Yeah, brilliant. And you walk up, walk down. Yeah, yeah. It was brilliantly uh, yeah. choreographed and brilliantly, I mean, the, the projections and the, and yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 help me. You Google it again. Uh, the guy who 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 did the sets. He has a weird name, like something Wolf, Beowulf. Oh, Beowulf. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. See. Thank you. He's brilliant. He's gonna kill me because we're friends. No, no, yeah. Well, listen. <laughs> Teen Wolf. Teen Wolf. Yeah. There you go. You originated the role of King Triton in the Broadway production of Disney's The Little Mermaid. <laughs> yes, I did. So what are your fondest <laughs> memories of playing a Disney king? I, you know, that movie was one of my favorite, favorite movies. I was, I don't know, I, I hate to admit this, but I was 27 years old and like, oh, The Little Mermaid. You know, <laughs> but I remember going to, the, uh, going to see it at the theater and I was like, wow. And come to find out, that uh, one of my friends was in the movie, so it was, it was, it was kind of like cool that I got to play, to be a part of it. When they again another time when they said you have an audition for this show, I'm thinking because a guy in the movie was African American, I'm going to go in for the crab. They're like, no, we want you as the king. <laughs> wow, that's deep. Okay, so and and what I loved about that was the fact that they saw white, black, Asian. They saw different people. So I was in a mix of, of uh, a pool of different people. Yeah. So what are your fondest memories of doing that show? I mean, you're like King Neptune. Yeah. Well, Six oh, acts. Triton, Triton. Well, I know, but I, I still call him Neptune. Okay. You know, I know <laughs> I'm, the I'm the son of Neptune. I'm the son of Neptune. So you look just like your father. Exactly. With your um, abs. I, I knew that I had to, I was doing uh, Les Mis at the time, and when they had me come in, they, they had us wear um, uh, wife beaters. I shouldn't say that word, should I? T-shirts that are tank tops. And, <laughs> oh, God, I'm going to get criticized for that. Oh, no, but Marlon Brando called them that. It's the Marlon okay. Brando T-shirt. Marlon Brando T-shirt. The wife beater. <laughs> and because uh, they wanted to see what our body looked like. And the, and the way that the costume was built, it was a bodice, and then there was mesh on top of that. So, you know, no matter who they hired, he would have looked like he was in shape. Well, I said, well, since it's going to be so tight, I have a few months. Let me just start kind of working out a little bit, just to kind of get going. And I did, and I wasn't fanatic about it, but um, but I got into better shape. We had another fitting, so they took the bodice away, and they said, "Well, we'll just have you in mesh, and then paint these abs on." So I said, "Okay, that's cool with me." Then by the time we got to Denver, that was about six months after I found out I was in it. I had been working out, and I guess I looked pretty decent. So we tried the mesh, and they said, "Well." Uh, it looks horrible under the lights. Would you mind going topless? And I wish I had not negotiated. <laughs> like, I wish I could have negotiated before that. But, you know, we, the contract was already signed. So I said, sure, I'll do anything for the cause. And uh, so I had to make sure that I kept working out. Uh, but, yeah, that was two years of, uh, 
<laughs> of discipline for me. But it was great being in the show. We had a great uh, cast again, yeah. and the the set was a beautiful design. Sierra Bagas is probably the premier soprano right now of, of Broadway, and such a goofball. And uh, I love her to death. She's I call her my daughter. Um, we just had a great time. Yeah. yeah, and you know to be a part of this this corporation of Disney. You know, there's it's fun. It's and you saw the the faces of these kids when you walked out, and the moms and oh, yeah. the dads, and and I got to meet some incredible people that came backstage. I think the the biggest deal we had a lot of stars come back with their kids and stuff, and but I, everybody in the theater wanted to meet the Beckhams. It was very funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was very funny. Really? Yeah. Yeah, there were sometimes some, you know, some celebrities would come yeah. and people would go, well, maybe I'll meet them, maybe I won't. But the Beckhams were there, front of house came, <laughs> everybody came to, to take pictures with them. What about the skates? It was, um, I, you know, it was funny because people, people pick on us about those damn Heelys. Um, we, I, I thought it was brilliantly choreographed because they didn't know how they were going to get around, you know, because it's underwater and you just can't walk underwater. So... Um, he came up with this idea, um, help me, oh my God, I should be better at this, the choreographer. Oh yeah, where's my Google Yeah, where's man? the Google guy? Thank you very much, we have Google here, theatrical Google. He's British and he did Mary Poppins as well. Uh, but anyway, once we get that, yell it out. But anyway, he came up with it because he saw uh, some kids uh, in an airport yeah. and they were healing and he was like, that's how we're gonna do this. And when we first saw the women, doing that as the daughters of Triton, I was like, they look like a school of fish. That looks, br that's great. I didn't have to actually learn how to do it. They wanted me to be the king and walk around. But I asked Francesca Zambello, who was our director, I got her name, um, uh, <laughs> Mir, Stephen Mir, Stephen Mir. Stephen Mir, thank yeah, you. Stephen Mir was the, uh, the choreographer. choreographer. Um, and I said, let me just explore it. Let me just in investigate what this language is of, of being on the Heelys. And we worked it into the show. And where if I would have to go save my daughter, I would swoosh off instead of walk off. You know? But I couldn't wear those shoes the whole show because they were like two and a half inches. They were like women, not high heels, but two and a half inches yeah. is a lot. And I don't care how masculine you are, if you're walking in high heels, you can't walk masculine. So, so they made me, <laughs> and so they made me wear regular shoes on my walking scenes. But then I wore the heelys when I had to, you know, skate around. No, because what I meant, I have no coordination. I could never wear them. I can't roller skate or ice skate. So I was wondering how you made it all look so smooth. I, I, it, I had a lot of training because I'm, not, I wasn't that good either. But, yeah. uh, but I, I luckily learned what I had to do. Perfect. You gave a career-defining performance as Porgy. In the recent new production Thank you. of the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, had you sung opera before? I, I attempted opera. Uh, I, I did Porgy and Bess with the Orlando Opera Company um, because they needed black people on stage. So I auditioned to be on that show. Um, and I got to be with the professionals. But, uh, and, I, and I also was in a production of Faust uh, with the Orlando Opera Company. So that's my history with that. I've never really studied opera. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I have that sort of training, but um, it was brilliant to be among uh, those people in Orlando to hear that. When they were, again, this is another casting thing that I, when they said you have an audition for Porgy and Bess, I'm thinking sport and life because they usually hire someone who is musical theater background for that, even in the opera world. But now they want you for Porgy. And so I said, wow. So um, I had performed Porgy songs in concert before, so I was familiar with that. But it was, uh, it was, it was, it was great to go in there. And they raised the key uh, on a couple of things because they wanted more of the meat of my voice. And then they lowered the key for, uh, for certain people. Like with Audra, they had to lower certain, certain songs just because it's eight shows a week. Yeah. And you can't sing opera eight shows a week. Um, and she did such an amazing job, um, yelling and screaming and then coming out with a beautiful high soprano note. That's why she has that damn Tony. Um, yeah, yeah, she was just, and it was masterful to watch her on stage and to be with her on stage every night. Well, you've received many accolades. Every yeah. award should have come your way too because I thought you were one of the most brilliant porgies I've ever seen. Oh, thank you. Right? Thank you. 
I want to talk about the physicality. I know someone had asked a question, gave me a card about the physicality of Porky. I mean, I don't know how you walked on your foot. <laughs> and can you just tell us the magic now that the show is over? Was it in the shoe? No, it was just me. Are it you was me. Serious? Yeah, I would turn my foot in. What what happened was we had a, a physical therapist that showed us. Um, basically what muscles to use and not use because she worked with people who were physically challenged and I had to do exercises going up and down stairs sitting and sitting uh, turning around you know just challenges that we don't even think about um, but it morphed it, it, it started off where I just kind of did it like that and then it kind of slowly turned in I don't know why but I was all right I was actually okay because I would get physical therapy every day and also um, I stretched every day did some yoga and I had a chiropractor uh, chiro a chiropractor who would uh, put me in you know yeah. get me right this must have been a dream role for you talk about creating this with Diane Paulus and Audra the three of you together right. working on this and then performing it it was um, well we Diane, another brilliant I love my directors um, brilliant director who gave us the the base of what she knew and the knowledge that she knew then we read the book and we brought a lot of what the book had to offer. We studied the music, studied the notes. We knew we were gonna to have to cut a lot of the notes out because it's a, almost a four hour opera. And we were trying to make it two and a half hours. We just wanted to get to the meat of what the story was. And um, for instance, there was a moment where I saved Bess from doing some cocaine. And because she's trying to better herself for me, I'm trying to better myself for her by taking a bath and <laughs> cleaning up a little bit. But she's trying to better herself for me by getting off drugs and see, being accepted into the community. I catch her with uh, happy dust on her hand that Sport and Life has given her. I scare him away and I tell her to come to me and I wipe it off of her hand. And with every ounce of her being, she says, thank you. She doesn't know how to, but she says, thank you, because that's one of the first times a guy has been nice to her without wanting something. She walks away, and I say, Bess. And there's a one tiny note that the cellist gives me. You is my woman now. You is. Instead of, which is beautiful, but it, it, it would have taken us to another place if we had gone, da na 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 Best you, you know, it would have taken us out of that moment. So we wanted to get to the meat and heart of what the story was, and I think that that's we've we accomplished that with the entire piece. Yeah. And working at working with Audra McDonald, yeah. what you learned as an actor, both of you off each other. Yeah, she was well. First of all, Audra's a game is up here, so. Unless you want to look stupid, you got to bring your game up there as well. And she's not, it's not that she's not giving, she's giving, and, but she needs to feed off of what you have. And so I loved that. Yeah. Um, we've been friends for years, but it was the first time we ever got a chance to do a full on production together. And she's one of these actresses. Uh, LaShawn's is another person I've worked with, uh, Tina Fabrik, also, uh, who I can just, I can be on stage and I can trust no matter what, because we, we didn't do the same show every night. We stayed within the same context of what the story was, but we didn't do the same show every night. And I could trust wherever she went, I would go. Wherever I would go, she would go. So it was, it was it, yeah, it was beautiful. Everybody in that show lived in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Diane has a little trick or a little task that she wants you to do. No matter if you have a name, uh, a character name in the show or not, she wants you to give a five minute presentation uh, to the cast and tell you, tell each of us who you are. And I found out that I had cousins on stage, you know what I mean? So I related to that person. If they didn't even have a name, I would say, hey, Billy Bob, what's up? And we were those characters f while we were on stage. That's what I love about all of her shows. Mm -hmm. Anybody in the ensemble had a whole backstory of what got them to right. Catfish Row or whatever, right. who they were related to. Yeah, the well that you yeah. saw on stage actually came out of one of the presentations because um, uh, the Natasha Williams, who played Mariah, said that she dug this well so that this or community could have fresh water. Yeah. So they were like, hmm. So Diane decided to put that on Broadway. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there was that little bit of controversy before you all came mm. in with the, I think the New York Times, and there were many 
major names that came out against this production that no one had seen. Right, right. What was going on during in the rehearsal room with all of you when this controversy was going on and not being pure and not being this and that? Well, I, it was... We we decided not to lash out because we were you know we were very angry and you know Twitter and Facebook and we can just say you know screw off. But um, Jeffrey Richards came to us and said, "Let's just concentrate on the work," and that's what we did. We said we're going to let the work speak for itself because at that time, with all of the backlash, no one had seen the show. Exactly. We hadn't even previewed yet. We hadn't even done our first dress rehearsal yet. So I think people were just a little scared that we were going to destroy this masterpiece. But what basically we wanted to do was bring some truth and authenticity to it. And, you know, the, the, our, one of our major controversies was the fact that we said that these characters were not fully developed. And God bless the Gershwins, but they didn't fully develop these characters. It's a beautiful opera. Go see it. But these are archetypes. And in fact, a lot of African Americans for years would not even look at it or touch it. Uh, Sidney Poitier was, he was contractually, he contractually had to do the movie, but he distanced himself away from that because he just, he didn't want to be this stereotypical archetype character without any base. You know, uh, Audra was, she calls herself a drug addicted whore. But why is she a drug addicted whore? So she did what she did as far as finding research and what was her backstory was um, she was abandoned and you know I think she even lost a child, uh, miscarried or something, um, or gave one of her kids away, something like that. That's why she was so into Clara's child. Um, there was a scar that she had that's in the book that no other Bess ever does. But in the book, she's, she's scarred because Crown beats the hell out of her all the time. So she wanted to make sure that she had a scar. You know, I wanted to find out what Porky's plight was in this community. Why was he a cripple? Because he couldn't do anything else. I mean, he couldn't be a, a seaman. He couldn't be someone that goes and picks cotton. The only thing he could do was beg. So. That's why he was that size. Because I think when I spoke to you all on opening night, you said you all went back to the original book right, and right. found all these wonderful things about these characters right. to add into it. Just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant night of theater. Thank you. Something else you can cross off your bucket list is you played the role of Valentine in the <laughs> musical Two Gentlemen of Verona yeah. in Central Park, right? Yeah. The public. Yeah, that was fun. Fun night. What what goes on when you appear in the Central Park in the middle of a summer? What crazy things happen? It's uh, well, bugs flying in your mouth, uh, raccoons running across the stage, uh, and we're we're you know because they're protected, we can't do anything except for the bugs. But uh, but we can't do anything. The turtles. There's all kinds of wildlife that's out, out there. Um, but yeah, there's there's uh, it, it is fun. You're under the stars. It could rain. Uh, you know, we we were scared that there were a couple of times we were going to get rained out. But it rained for a little bit, then it stopped, and we continued the show. Um, you know, anyone could be yelling somewhere, and you can hear that stuff going on. <laughs> but it's people are there to see this, uh, to have a fun night, a fun evening outside, and watch great theater. And that show, uh, if you don't know it, two gentlemen, the musical version is written by the same people who wrote Hair, so it's really fun music. You love doing that, right? I did. I would. That was do a Clifton again. Davis role. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, you are known to millions of fans around the world for playing Senator Edison Davis, opposite Kerry Washington and Tony Goldwyn. Yep. Yeah. On the hit ABC political thriller Scandal. Scandal. How did you get cast in that? Well, my audition was Porgy and Bess, believe it or not. I, uh, they, the, Chandra Rhymes and her Chandra Land people came to see Audra do the, uh, she's from private practice. They came to see her do Porgy and Bess. And I just happened to be this accessory on stage <laughs> that they didn't know. <laughs> they, in fact, Linda Lowe, who was the casting director, confessed to me she said I had no idea who you were she kept looking through the which is fine I mean you know not that you need to know me but um, she kept looking through the playbill saying is he from Canada why don't I know this guy he's got, what? <laughs> so uh, that was my audition and then I had a, a legit audition to go in for on camera and usually when that happens uh, there's about four or five other guys waiting with you but I was the only guy that showed up so I thought that was kind of weird. And then they held me into, in the room for two hours, going over different scenes and different. So that was, in essence, my screen test. And I got the call the next day. Luckily, the producers of Porgy and Bess, we were closing in, a, in a, about five weeks. They allowed me to, um, 
to go to LA. So what I had to do for five weeks was fly to LA after the matinee on Sunday, do as many days as I could out in LA, and then come back and do the rest of the week on Porgy. So I was for five weeks, I was flying back and forth. Wow. Yeah. Fun times. Fun times. And I can say, but I was in a hit television show and the star of a Broadway show at the same time. <laughs> Do you like working on television? I do. Coming from the theater world? Yeah, it's scary and it's intimidating because it's so, you know, because we're so used to being Broadway, but it's, you know, you bring it down. In fact, one of my first TV gigs, I was a guest star on a show called Strong Medicine. And Carl Weathers, who played Apollo Creed in the Rocky movies, was the director. (laughs) And I'm talking like I'm talking now, and which I find not that loud, but we were doing certain scenes (laughs) and he said, okay, wait. After about the third or fourth take, he said, okay, brother, hold on. You do theater, right? And I said, yeah. He said, you know what? It shows. You got this big voice. You need to bring it down here when you're talking about your wife and your kid. You know, you lost your wife and you lost your kid, so you have to talk to the, talk to the doctor. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You have to talk to the doctor like this and say, why is my wife acting this way? I was like, wow. So I had to learn to be a little bit more minimal. Because every Broadway star who sat in that chair, yeah. when the first time they did TV, I said, was it intimidating when you get it? It's a whole different thing. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, so yeah. that strong medicine was like, oh my God, I'm not doing the right thing. Not doing the right thing, yeah. yeah. You'll feel like you're acting. But he just said, just, you know, just, it's in your eyes. It's in your eyes, man. It's all in the head. No, but <laughs> yeah. it really is. It's, it's all here. It's all yeah. about the face. Because you can't, right? when you see it, you're like, oh, okay, I get it. It's all a close up here, yeah. a close up here, a very tight medium shot. Right, right, right. All right, so doing Porgy and Bass and doing the television show, going back and forth. Mm -hmm. How much time did you have to create the character of the senator? I mean... Two minutes. Um, It was was interesting because Kerry Washington is probably one of the most brilliant people I've ever gotten a chance to work with. It's yeah. watching her, just, she knew everyone's name on the set. Like, she knew their dog's name. She knew their grandmother's name. She kept asking, so how's Grandma Susie? I know she was sick the other day. You know, it's like, whoa. Um, but she wanted to know the backstory. She said, well, how did we meet? And I said, so, okay, let's discuss this. So in the makeup chair in the hair, hair room, we would discover our backstory. And, and then we would try to bring that subtext to whatever that scene was. Um, she's, she's great. They were so lucky. She's lucky to have the show, but they were so lucky to get her because she, could, she is ready for anything that they throw at her. They changed a lot of stuff on the dime. You know, I'm freaking out. I was like, ah, I just learned my lines. But she was like, I got this. I got this. So. So I was going to ask you, is it a quick shoot? It obviously is. It's, it's a quick, they have 10 days that they can shoot one episode. Sometimes they get it done before then. But what they also do, and if you notice the show, they talk very quickly, right? Or we talk very quickly. And um, th- normally, let's just say an episode uh, for a regular hour-long series will be about 80 pages, I mean, 60 pages. What they would do is write 80 pages. So you have to get all the material in. And then they will cut back from that. I had a few scenes that I knew that were cut, that they spent, I mean, there was elaborate scenes. We were outside doing things, and that was nowhere to be seen when it finally came and finally aired. But um, they try to get as much material as they can in there. Yeah. Um, You're also known to millions of daytime fans for playing, is it Keith McLean? Keith McLean, yes. Right? The Black Irish. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> I, know, I love that, the Black Irish, and all my children. Yeah, yeah, that was that was fun. I got that, actually, from being in Sideshow. Oh, yeah, great. That's yeah. something nice that came out of that. Yeah, yeah. That's even faster of a soap world, right? Yeah, it is. It's because it's every day. And you, we learned how to, if you messed up on the line, you just stay still. They said, okay, we'll give you your line now, we'll pick it up, and then you continue. But because they just didn't have, I, I've gone back and looked at some of my, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it, I, I don't know how they hired me because it was the worst actor I've ever seen in my life. But Really? Yeah. Oh, so bad. You just hear a voice though. They're in some room somewhere, right? Yeah. There's no one on, there's really no one on the set. No, there's people in, there are people on the set. You mean as far as the director yeah. or the, yes, it's someone, someone, yes, in another room. And, uh, you just hear a strange voice. Yeah. I say, well, okay, take that one more time. You know, that kind of thing. But it's so quick. It's so quick. And I, one guy who was on the show played Edmund. I can't think of his real name, but he played Edmund on the show. And he said, Norm, if you ever want to like redo a scene, just say fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to redo it. <laughs> Sorry. 
Okay, a question that comes up here very often from our audience is about auditioning. Yes. Do you like to audition? No. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Someone looked but, at me, yeah, like I had three heads. How can you say that, Richie? No one does. No, I mean, it, it's, I've become a little more comfortable with it, and I just kind of go, you know what, these are my two minutes, I'm going to give you what I got. But it's, you know, you're, 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 that's where you're really being judged, and you're, you're trying to say, love me, love me. Uh, but I do know from being on the other side a couple of times, they want, they are supportive and they want you to be that person. All the time? Not all the time. Okay, Sometimes yes. they're a little catty. But, um, but, but for the most part, they want, you know, because it'll make their job easier if they can go, that's who we want. So you just go in there and just be prepared and try to do the best you can. I mean, I just had an audition a couple of days ago that just was horrible for a movie. I was prepared. I went in there and they said, they changed it up on me. And I'm like... Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> and and I, for some reason, I couldn't remember my lines. I was like, wait a minute, because I was so prepared for it. But I had one way of, of thinking about it. So anyway, yeah. yeah no, because everybody I've had in that chair has sort of shared either a very strange audition, or yeah. a bad one, or how you live through these. Or, yeah. So was last week the worst? Last <laughs> wasn't the worst. It was one of those worst ones. I'm trying to, let me see. What, can I give you a worse one? Uh, oh, well, well, when you do the singing auditions and you just can't hit the note, you know, you bring in a song that's too high. Yeah, that's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Were they early on? Was that before the parade passes by? Or that which was song did you after. Use? It was afterwards. And you, you try to, it was Bouidoy, actually, when you try to go for the B flat and it just was not there. It's like, oh, oh. But you just hope and pray. And I ended up getting the job anyway, but... I love that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> so just the advice is just sort of go and do the best you possibly can. Yeah, because it's it's your job is to get the call back. That's what I tell a lot of students. And you know, I, talk, I do master classes sometimes. Your job is to get the call back. And the only thing that you can do is be prepared, be, you know, look nice, and, and just have a great personality. It's not in your hands after that. You, you have no control. And you can't give more than what you 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 know what you can give. Yeah. You know, if you prepared enough, because you can't guess what's in their head uh, most of the time. You have to bring what you can bring. Because there are also people who give really great auditions. Right. Then they get cast and they can't do anything else. Right. Right. You hear right. Those I've heard too. those stories. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But you know, uh, you just one of the main advice uh, that I give to kids is like, no, have a sense of self. Yeah. Um, you could be rejected a lot, and you're going to get no's a lot, and it's nothing, nothing personal. Especially if you bring your A game, yeah. you uh, you just have to have a sense of self. Yeah. Sure. You have a beautiful CD called "This Is the Life," which you can get at Amazon. Beautiful CD. How did you choose the material? I, God, uh, well, before the parade passes by, I had to give, yes. <laughs> had to give tribute to that. Um, I just picked songs that influenced me. I, Misty, because my favorite singer is Johnny Mathis. Um, Moon River, uh, because, you know, come on, Andy Williams is just amazing. Uh, I just love, I grew up with crooners. Yeah. People considered me a crooner, so I grew up with the crooner world. It's not unusual. I had to have on because... <laughs> Uh, Tom Jones. Tom Jones. My mom made me watch Tom Jones, even though I enjoyed him, but I, I didn't get it at first. But mom would always tell me, just sit down and be quiet for a little bit, because mama has to pay attention to this boy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Now I do. Oh. Yeah. Do you like recording? I that do. That process? I do. I do. And, and, and uh, right now, in the throes of getting another one out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you do concerts all around the country and around the world. You yeah. do a lot of those beautiful cruises. Yeah. What do you love the most about doing live concerts? It's just the reaction that you get, the live reaction. I mean, anything can happen. Uh, uh, people can interrupt you. People can talk back to you. Um, I just, I love that one-on-one, that, -on -one, that energy that you get. Yeah. With, 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 you know, being filmed or being recorded, you don't get that, that, same, that same response. But I, I love that feedback. Yeah. And it's just you. It's, it's just you, me. Norm Lewis, singing as right. opposed to a character. Right, right, yeah. right. And you get into a character in particular, you know, for a particular song. But, yeah, um, but yeah it's just me. And uh, I'm goofy, and I think that people, you know, kind of like me. I'm a, I'm a nice guy, you know. 
People love you. <laughs> you played Reginald in the blockbuster film Sex in the City 2. Yes. And you had a big scene with Liza Minnelli. <laughs> I did. How much fun was that? I mean, to get right to do Sex in the City and do it with yeah, Liza she, Minnelli. Yeah, she did all the single ladies. She was fantastic. Um, it was, you know, that was a fun time. It, it, it took six days to shoot that little tiny scene. But... Um, <laughs> But it was fun, yeah, and it was about 500 people in that room. And luckily I knew the, the, the leads, yeah. and so I got to commune with them a lot. Um, but it was that, was, that taught me a lot too, about patience and, and being on a set of a movie and having to, to, to hurry up and wait kind of thing. Because it was shooting a huge production number, which right. even at MGM took many, many days. Took many, many days, yeah. So yeah. she would regale you with Different. stories, too, wouldn't she? She did, and she actually, when she finally finished, uh, she gave us a tiny little concert. She did about five songs, because Billy Stritch was there playing yeah. the piano and stuff, so it was great. She got to do a movie with her and get, and get a free concert. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you have a new film coming out called Winter's Tale, which right. I think is coming out in 2014. Right, February. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you play the custodian yeah. of a library. It's sort of like a library or something, right? right? yeah. Opposite Russell Crowe and Jennifer Conley. Yeah, well, Russell, uh, he's in the movie. I didn't get a chance to actually do my scenes with him, but okay. it was it was uh, Colin Farrell and Jennifer Conley. Great. Yeah, and uh, they, Jennifer Conley, it, her eyes are probably the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen in my life, and such a great actress, and, and actually the bad boy uh, Colin Farrell was is so good I think he's a underrated actor I think people don't really know his the wealth of what he can do yet yeah. but um, it was fun and I got the chance to to meet Russell Crowe right before we, we were it was the same week of the premiere of Les Mis so we were communing on our, our different Javert's and our different uh, takes on that oh really yeah 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 he loved doing that too that he did right? he had yeah. a great time and and funny enough he knew me which kind of blew my mind he was like Norm I'm like, <laughs> Russell Crowe, wow. Have you on the uh, but he's, he, when they were asking him to do the show, um, they brought him to the West End to see, and I was, happened to be in that production, and then they, uh, Hugh Jackman, um, wait a minute, let me pick that up. Yeah. Hugh Jackman um, <laughs> told me when I was at the Tonys, when I was nominated for Porky and Bess, um, <laughs> anybody? Um, <laughs> I was standing in line. It was funny because I was standing in line with my sister. I brought my sister as my date. And I was like watching her, seeing, being with all these stars. But Hugh Jackman came up to me and said, Hey, man, we used your uh, 25th anniversary as, gui as a guide for our movie. So I was like, That's cool. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Is there a dream role that you would like to tackle? Yes. Tell us. It stays here. No, let's tweet it. Do tweet all it you out. can. But not that I'm a huge fan of this show, but I want to set a precedent, and it's the Phantom of the Opera, because there's never been an African American to play it on Broadway. They they did have Robert Guillaume played Guillaume. it in in uh, in uh, L.A., yeah. but never on Broadway. And I just think, in 25 years, yeah. why not? Well, why let's not? put that out there. Yeah, yeah. I see it. It's just finished its 25th anniversary. Yeah. I see for the 26th anniversary. Right. Bring you in. I think so. I think that sounds good. You also want to do Valjean, right? I would like to do Valjean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People have asked me if I was uh, even being considered for this new production of, yeah. of Les Mis coming in as Javert, and I said, I'm, I've hung up Javert. I'm, you know, I put the coat up in the in the in the closet. But if if they were to ask me to do Valjean, I would do it. Yeah. Yeah, to explore that. Oh, you'd be great in that. Oh, I think so. Really perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Here are some questions from the audience. At the beginning of your career, like the first five years, what was that like for you? I was lucky because I got here, and I, like I said before, I, I, uh, I went to every audition. I showed up, and I, I worked that entire first year. I stayed non-equity. Uh, on purpose because I thought being in a union was Shangri-La. I thought that was like, you had to be really, and I found out that I wasn't that far from that. So I said, okay. So the next year I ended up getting uh, into the TYA and got my equity card. And from that, uh, other shows started coming in, not as frequent as the first year, but they started coming in. And, uh, but I had to do a lot of other jobs, waiting on tables, and I also, because I had some um, computer skills, I would work for, for temp companies and do things like that. But I always stayed focused, and I wouldn't go out drinking and, and all that. I would go home and make sure that I prepared for my next audition or whatever. And one of my first 
another one of my first uh, equity gigs was a show called Abyssinia that That's Tina right. Fabrique and I did, and that was in Cleveland, uh, Ohio. So, um, and it, from that, there was a a backers audition of Abyssinia to try to bring it to Broadway, yeah. and it was at the old Roundabout Theater on, on on Broadway. I can't remember what street that was, but it was. You remember the, the old, old Criterion Center? Is that the yeah, yeah. It was the Bond store? Yes, yes. And so um, from that backers audition, a lot of the big people that were in the show, like Tina and and uh, Jennifer Lee Warren, and they invited their agents, and I got two agents from that backers audition. So I never had to do the agent thing where I had to mail the letters and yeah. all that stuff. I've been so blessed. Uh, you know, g- God, yeah. whoever you believe in, has guided me through this career. I've had some really great experiences since I've been here. Did you ever consider leaving the business? And if so, what moment or event changed your mind not to? Never really thought about leaving. Um, but I, I did want to slow down at one time. Like I, I remember when I left... Miss Saigon, I knew I had to find a job that could pay as much as Miss Saigon, yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't go back to waiting on tables or because I just wasn't enough money for me, and and so I ended up getting uh, my real estate license. But um, while I was doing that, it took up a lot of my time, and it I didn't want it to interfere with my my focus of, of you know my plight of being in musical theater and you know doing this business. Um, never really thought about leaving. I mean, there was fleeting moments of like, oh, yeah. my life sucks. This audition was terrible. They're never going to want me again, that kind of thing. But that goes away very quickly. Yeah. Do you have any plans to come back to the West End, London, to perform there? I would love to. Um, I, I don't know what show, but I've gone over, I was just over there this past summer just to visit. And I said, Cameron, if there's anything, <laughs> I, would, I would go back to the West End in a heartbeat. Phantom. Phantom of the opera. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Having worked with some of the biggest names on Broadway, both actors and composers, is there anyone you'd love to work with that you haven't yet? Wow. I got a tiny glimpse of working with Harold Prince. Uh, We did the workshops of Parade. And I couldn't do Parade because I ended up doing Sideshow. So it conflicted with each other. So I would like to work with Harold Prince. Yeah. 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 Because you've worked with most of the masters. Yeah, yeah. Which stage role was the most fun for you? You know, it's funny because I love all of the roles that I've done. You know, the painter, um, even being Porgy. Porgy was definitely probably the most meaningful, I guess, if you will, uh, to me. But I played Doc in in uh, Captain's Courageous for Manhattan Theater Club. Yeah. I literally had four lines. That's all I had. And I had a couple of singing little lines. But that role meant a lot to me because they were teaching us, uh, it was about fishermen in Gloucester, Mass. And they wanted to teach us a Gloucester, Massachusetts accent back in the 1930s. And I said, this doesn't feel right. I don't think of, and not that I'm some, you know, Louis Farrakhan racist kind of guy, but I just didn't feel like that an African American at that time would have a Gloucester, Massachusetts accent. Through research, I found out there were a lot of fishermen that would go down to the Caribbean and bring a lot of Caribbeans up to work on the ships. And because I was a cook, I said, that's it. So I, I incorporated this tr- uh, Trinidadian accent. And that, that <laughs> oh, hey man. Um, but but I, uh, because of the research that I did on that role, and I just loved doing it. And it was with this, this wealth of just men in this chorus, and it, just, it was great, it was fun. Someone has a double question. What's your mm. worst audition experience? We talked about that. Right. But what's your worst rehearsal experience where it finally came around for you? Was there something in a rehearsal room that you weren't getting something and then all of a sudden something clicked and set you on your path working on a role? Hmm. Wow, that, that's happened a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's happened a lot. But I mean, even with the, the experience of playing Sweeney, where you know, it, it wasn't clicking you know, for, for uh, Eric Schaefer, the director, yeah. he, it, 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 I was going through, just going through the motions, but, um, but finding that, that, that deep-seated anger the next day helped a lot. Um, I would also say, I mean, I've been sick a lot, and uh, uh, I, was, I had pneumonia, uh, which I didn't know I had when we were doing Sondheim on Sondheim in the oh. beginning, and I was just very quiet, and people were like, what's wrong with you? But, um, 
once, once I found out I was sick, then I could really figure out what was going on. And um, it, when, it, when it got better, it, it, it clicked in, yeah. into that respect. I'm trying to think. Those no, are good. Nothing significant, nothing major, no. yeah. majorly significant. But I mean, I've had those moments in each show that I've done. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I'm sure if it's really scary, Sondheim on Sondheim, working with him, working right. with Lapine, and not knowing you're just sitting there saying, you know, this is not me. I have no idea what's happened. Right. Now I'm sick. I'll be fine. Right, you right. Know? And I, I would say, too, like, uh, to kind of an adjunct to that question, um, singing being alive uh, as a youth, you know, just hitting the notes and being fancy meant a lot, uh, was a different meaning when I got to play Bobby and company. Uh, I was 37 at the time, and that meant a lot to me yeah. uh, because I was Bobby's age, and, it, and I was kind of going through what he was going through. Then at age 47, singing that song, I had just come off of a breakup, so that really meant a whole other thing for me. Yeah. So. Uh, hopefully that kind of answers sure. the question oh, a little yeah. bit. Yeah. You know, you, th this person asked a question about Sideshow. You looked back at your fondest memories, but you got to sing You Should Be Loved. Right, right. And he said, would you just like sing a line of that? That was a beautiful song <laughs> from that show. <laughs> to make uh, you sing for your supper. You don't have to, but... It... You should be loved by someone who knows you. Wants you to blossom always is true. You should be cherished like the first time of springtime. Is that right? You should be loved in the way I love you. Oh, that sounds horrible. That sounds that horrible. great. You're oh. hired. All through the... No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> My last two questions are, at this point in your life, what are you the most proud of personally and professionally? God, you're good at this. Um, what am I most proud of personally? Um, that I am just someone who has a great reputation in this business uh, because your reputation is, is so important. And um, I mean, if I can say anything about me, I mean, people have said some really nice things, but I'm a nice guy and I'm a hard worker and I love people, um, and I'm proud of that, um, proud of being here at age 50. Um, professionally, that I'm a nice guy, and I'm still in this business, and I've gotten to play roles that are, are very non-specific and non-traditional, and, and uh, I hope that I've, in, I've inspired some people. In fact, um, my friend Chapman Roberts and I, who is an amazing, amazing, performer, orchestrator, arranger, just an all-around gentleman. He and I are co-producing a, a show at Carnegie Hall. We have the dates already, uh, June 23rd, and it's celebrating African-American men in theater. And so we want to do this before, you know, we have these people that are still here, J Jeffrey Holder, Sidney Poitier, um, uh, James, uh, James Earl Jones. We're going to honor the people who have passed on, the people who are still here, and there are going to be some performances, but it's going to be at Carnegie Hall. We're very proud of that. So in saying that, I've had a lot of young African-Americans and a lot of people in general, but specifically African-American men come up to me who said that I've inspired them. So I'm very proud of that. What's the date again? June 23rd. Yeah, let's hear it. That's beautiful. June 23rd. And my last question is, what's the best bit of advice that you were given that you still live by? Wow. Um, just be true to who you are. Just find a sense, because in the end, uh, no matter who's in your life, they will, they will go away some, sometime, whether just because of how life is or, or as far as evolving in a different relationship, or they may pass on or something. So you have to have a sense of who you are. Um, and I think that that's what's kind of maintained me. Uh, I, I have a strong spiritual background. And even if I'm alone, I know that I'm taken care of. Um, it, what was the line? It said, I might not know my future, but I know who holds my future. So um, I have that strong sense. Um, and the best advice I can give anyone is just, you know, just find that. Just find who you are and be true to who you are. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You are one of my favorite people. We oh. go back a long time. Thank yeah. you for doing this this afternoon. I am so honored. Thank you, Richie Ridge. Um, seriously. Wow. Thank you.